Okay, good evening everyone and a very warm welcome to this lecture um, in Queen's University Belfast. My name is Noli Hute Dundas, I'm Professor of Innovation Management and Policy and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor of the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences and it's my great privilege tonight to welcome you all on uh, behalf of Queen's Management School and also the Chief Executives Club to the annual Mary McAleese Diversity Lecture. In particular, I want to extend a very warm word of welcome to our guest speaker, Professor Deidre McCluskey, who is Professor Emerita of Economics and Economic History at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Deidre, we are genuinely thrilled that you not only kindly accepted our invitation to speak tonight, but also that you're here in person to deliver this important lecture. And I know I speak on behalf of the entire audience when I say that we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say to us in your address. The aim of this diversity lecture series, which is now unbelievably in its fourth year, is to promote greater equality and diversity in the workplace, particularly with regards to ensuring equality of opportunity and respect for diversity across the university and the wider community. The series is named after former President of Ireland, Mary McAleese, herself an advocate for equality and diversity and who was our inaugural speaker back in 2019. At Queen's, Equality and diversity, I have it here, it's high on our agenda, but it's much more than that. It's a priority. It's an area that we are fully committed to improving. Not because we could, but we should. We have to do it. We have to embrace this much more moving forward and, and prioritise our words and also our actions. Queen's has been and is a founding partner and, and diversity champion of the Northern Ireland Diversity Mark, an uh, initiative which was spearheaded by Women in Business Northern Ireland. And we're delighted that representatives of Women in Business are here tonight. The university signed up at the Charter Mark's launch in September 2017. This year, Queen's Gender Initiative is celebrating 22 years of supporting the participation and progression of women in Queen's. We were one of the first universities in the UK to sign up to the Athena Swan Charter, which was established by the Equality Charter Challenge Unit in London in 2005. The university currently holds a prestigious Athena Swan Silver Award and an additional 15 school awards. Overall, Queen's as an institution, and particularly the management school, is committed to ensuring that we have an inclusive future for all of our staff, aligned with our strategy 2030 and our core values. Equally, we recognise that this is a journey and there is much work that is still to be done in creating a truly equal, diverse and inclusive environment in which we work and we learn. This lecture series is therefore critical in challenging the way that we think and our efforts to establish the right culture at Queen's. It's now a great honour to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Deidre McCluskey. As I previously mentioned, Deidre McCluskey is Distinguished Professor Emerita of Economics and Economic History at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Trained at Harvard as an economist, she has written 24 books and some 400 academic and popular articles on economic history, rhetoric, philosophy, statistical theory, economic theory, feminism, queer studies, liberalism, ethics and law. And her best known works include her trilogy, The Bourgeois Era in 20, 20, 2006, 2010 and 2016, The Rhetoric of Economics and The Cult of Statistical Significance in 2008. Deidre describes herself as 
a literary, quantitative, postmodern, free market, progressive Episcopalian, ex markoid Midwestern woman who was once a man. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> all of them, all of them. Uh, crossing, a memoir, uh, is a moving and sensitive account of Deidre's transition. Deidre is an advocate of robust discussion, which I hope we see tonight, and is a very strong supporter, quite rightly, of academic freedom. She has ancestral roots in Northern Ireland and is an honorary professor here at Queen's Management School, of which we're incredibly proud to have you associated with our school. I personally can't wait to hear what you have to say to us, so please join me in welcoming Professor Deidre McCluskey with her lecture entitled, I've Done My Part. Thank you very much. I have a speech defect, as you'll see, but it'll improve as I talk. When I was a child, I had a very severe stutter, and then I gradually got to the point where you can't stop me from talking. I'm just talk, 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 talk. I'm, I'm here in praise of diversity. Now, I, I was born in a privileged way. I had the good sense and the good taste to choose my parents very carefully. I chose my father, who was a Harvard professor, and my mother, who was an opera singer, which is one of the problems, I think, in talking about equality of opportunity. Opportunity is extremely hard to equalize. What we can equalize tomorrow is equality of permission, allowing, if you're born a, a woman, as alas I was not, to train to become an airline pilot, to allow you, if you're an American black, <clears throat> to get a mortgage, which shamefully, from the late 1930s on was not the case. To equality of permission is in a sense easy from a policy perspective. You, you, you don't need to worry about secondary effects. They're all going to be good. So I advocate classical liberalism. Adam Smith, I always cross myself when mention Adam Smith. Uh, if I ever mention him again, Adam Smith. Um, I, I, I'm an Anglican, so I, I believe in the efficacy of prayer, but not the rosary. So you can, you can t t t t t t take that as you wish. So, or, or of John Stuart Mill, Mary with Wollstonecraft, even Milton Friedman, my former colleague at the University of Chicago, these were people who believed in equality of permission. And if you grant equality of per this equality of per permission, then you're going to have a diverse school of business, a diverse factory workplace, a diverse airline pilots association, you're, you're going to have a mix of human characters, human uh, folk, a fair field full of folk. And that's good on ethical grounds. The core of liberalism, which is now being fought out in Ukraine and on the streets of Iran is equality of souls brought down to the secular level. I'm a, I'm a Christian liberal. I, I honor St. Paul 
said that all souls are equal, but he said so in an economy and society of hierarchy. He said there is no, neither slave nor free, Gentile or Jew, but all are one in Christ Jesus. Sure enough, Paul, <laughs> but how about secular equality of permission? In his world of zero sum, to have a luxury, you needed a slave. In our world, you don't. You can have electric lights and automatic microphones and wonderful published books instead of scrolls. This is Crossing, um, which is my account of my transition. You can have all those without slaves, but St. Paul, and indeed for the next 1,700 years, Christianity didn't bring it to the secular part. And it's the secular part that Adam Smith praised, the part of treating equal everyone with equal respect. Adam Smith is not honored in the Scotland of his birth, alas. He's thought of in a sort of one sentence short form as a conservative and against the working class or something foolish like that. He was a great egalitarian. He was harshly hostile to slavery. Even the mind, and especially indeed the mind slavery, which was developing at the time in his lifetime in the, in the, in the, in the coal fields in, in the south of Scotland. So equality of permission in the, is, is a fundamental dignity of humans. It's disgraceful to treat women as inferior or to absorb them in the man, as in English co common law was the case, their husbands. It's disgraceful that a person is a chattel slave to someone else. And it's disgraceful that you citizens should be serfs or slaves to others in your society through the state. And that's the central claim of 19th century li 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 liberalism, Herbert Spencer and all that, this claim that the state is a dangerous master. We need states, I'm not an anarchist, but I believe that they should be small and confined to certain spheres. And for the rest, if we leave people alone, we achieve diversity by itself, which is a good, I, I say, but we also achieve wealth, high income, enrichment. The word, the, the, the phrase, the industrial revolution, which was brought to English from French by Arnold um, uh, um, Toynbee, not the universal historian of the 20th century, in, in honor of whom the first Arnold Toynbee was named, but Arnold Toynbee the first, a 32-year-old university lecturer who wrote a book of an account of the Industrial Revolution in England, which was in, in inspired by Marx and Engels and took the view that the Industrial Revolution was a terrible imposition on the working class of Britain and that uh, the way forward was socialism, regulation, action by the uh, um, state. Now, I, I would claim that it's liberty 
that made us rich. It's not the action of, of the state. I have the first cold I've had in two and a half years since we've all been masked all this time. Uh, that's the side, be, side be benefit of this imposition by the state. There are at least two ways in which diversity is enriching. If accompanied by liberty that makes for it in the first place, the, the first way is the gain from trade. Clearly, if everyone in this room was exactly identical, there was an American car, car, cartoonist who imagined schmooze, which were exactly ident identical creatures that you could eat or be friends with or do whatever you want. They were all exactly ident identical. If we were all identical, there would be no basis for trade. What would be the point if each of us had the same age, the same uh, gender, the same, the same education, the same endowment of resources, the same, the same, the same? It's out of diversity that trade yields its benefits. The, 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 this, by the way, is something that St. Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 12 where he talks about the various gifts that people have. Some have the gift of eloquence, some have the gift of this, that, and the other thing. But that, again, was in a hierarchical, frozen society. In the old phrase in English, the great chain of being, from the king to the, to the, to the family dog. And you were fixed. If you were born a m m m milkmaid on the whole, although it can be exaggerated as the great medievalist we have in, in, in attendance has shown. Um, if you were born as a milkmaid, you stayed as a milkmaid. In a diverse, liberated society, you can be born as a milkmaid and become, let's say, the Queen Consort of England and Northern Ireland and Wales and Scotland all together. Uh, so that's, that's one way. And it's an important one. It's been reliably uh, calculated, somewhat startling calculation, that if there was free trade in humans, I don't mean trade in a, in a slavery sense, but if you could move, if, any, if everyone in the world could move anywhere they wanted to, if there was open migration to um, the United Kingdom or the United States, and emigration from China, however, if all borders fell, income per head in the world real income per head would increase 50%. And that's somewhat surprising. And a, a, a morally gratifying argument for freer migration. But that's, that's only a small part of the advantage of diversity. Because the other advantage is advantage in diversity of ideas. It's not inevitable that men and women have different ideas, though I've been on both sides, and I can tell you they do. Uh, but it's likely that they do, that old people and young people, that people from uh, Nigeria and people from Venezuela have different ideas is very likely. That people from the north and the south, from the east and the west, rich and poor, with different life experiences, have different ideas. This isn't to take a kind of 
vulgar materialist um, view of how ideas are formed. I think they're highly individual, but they depend crucially on, li on liberty, on the liberty such as universities at their core are sworn to protect for their, for their variety coming from different voices to have effect. And this is as true in a, in a workplace as it is on a university of faculty. There is, you may know, you've certainly heard about it, an intolerance of other opinions growing on university campuses in, the, in our, my country and yours. And this is a serious problem. <clears throat> I'm, I'm involved on the advisory uh, committee of a new university, the University of Austin in Texas, which is being founded as a free speech university. Catherine Stock and I, she was the one who was driven from her post at the University of Sussex by students complaining and threatening violence against her for her views on gender change, which are not mine. But she and I both taught for a week in a in experimental courses at this new university called Forbidden Ideas. I taught about Marx. I am a former Marxist, a recovering Marxist, you might say. And it's taken me a long time to recover. Uh, as, a, as a child, you might say, as a lad, I was a folk singer. And I now still know more left-wing and labor songs than uh, I think anyone here. The people's flag is deepest red, it's sheltered off to our martyr dead. That's only the beginning. I could go on and on. So I slowly, slowly became a liberal. I'm not a conservative. I'm not along the standard spectrum from left to right. We 19th century Adam Smith liberals float above the spectrum because we don't believe in the exercise of massive state power in any form, in the way of invasion, such as Putin has implemented, or in the way of infantilizing subsidies. We believe in liberated. Fortunately, I stutter on the word liberal, which I tell you is very irritating. <laughs> you can put some deep psychological explanation to it if you wish, but I, I always stutter on the word liberal. But anyway, liberated, um, diverse people make for a diverse community, and Catherine and I debated to show the students, to instantiate, to use the sophisticated word, a real debate. Catherine and I don't, don't agree. She's a, she follows the views of the TERF, the trans-exclusionary radical feminists. I don't. I think the older ones of them are insincere, but in any case, sincere or not, they're mistaken. So we, we didn't agree, but we treated each other with the respect that's owed another human. And that's the core of liberalism and should be the core of the modern university, which was invented in 1810 in the, by von Humboldt of the U University of Berlin. The founding of the U University of Berlin was, was the creation of the combined teaching and research 
so characteristic of a modern university. But there's a liberal component, which we in the United States brag about a lot, um, that is a, a place of free discussion. And that's what a university should be. Research, teaching, free discussion. And that's what we're trying to build as more a prod to the other universities that might forget what their purpose is. But the economic point is a very important one. As I said, free movement would increase income by 50%. University education doubles your lifetime income compared with a secondary school education alone. So that's 100%. All very nice, all to be had. But look, we're trying to explain an increase since 1800 of income per head of a factor of 30, at least. 3,000%. In 1800 and before, <clears throat> average income in the world was on the order in modern prices of $2 a day. Imagine trying to make it in Belfast on $2 a day, sleeping rough, having one s s s set of clothing, eating potatoes and milk, which, by the way, is an excellent diet, um, as our common Irish ancestors did. $2 a day. Now, average income in the world is about, in the same prices, to the extent you can, it's not an easy calculation, but can be done approximately, is, is $50 a day. So it's, it's an increase from 2 to 50. And, and it's completely unprecedented. And it's vastly larger than what economists call the static gains from trade. What's going on here? What's going on is the astonishing explosion of ideas, of creative impulses in people liberated gradually more and more by the growth of diversity. First, the great first great achievement of li li liberalism was the ending of chattel slavery, finally abolished in the, in the British Empire in 1833. But then successive um, uh, liberations of poor men, of women, rather slowly, of colonial people at long length, uh, of queers of various kinds after a hundred year reign of terror confined to Protestant countries in, 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 in Catholic countries, homosexuality was never a criminal matter, uh, except in Ireland, by the way, under the influence of British law. The liberation of handicapped people, the further liberation of women, more and more people were brought into this conversation. Think of it as a conversation of creativity, a conversation as my, um, uh, uh, as, as has been said, of uh, ideas having sex. Um, you, you take the idea of rails that you use in underground ground coal mines in the northeast of England, 
And you say, now let's see, if I took a high pressure engine and put it in the front of these cars, I could make something called, let's see, a railway. So those ideas have sex with each other, and then their baby ideas have sex and sex and sex and sex and sex. This is um, um, uh, my good friend, what's his name? I'm, I'm forgetting his name. This is the problem with being 80 years old. So th there's been an astonishing explosion of creativity. And you can, you, you can see it all around us, uh, this plastic. This wonderful plastic um, uh, podium here. The inexpensive parquet flooring, which depends on the bandsaw as an invention of the early 19th century. Uh, glass in doors. <laughs> glass over the, of that character that you can use as a door is inconceivable 100 years ago. Uh, organizational changes like divided highway, the, the motorways, um, all kinds of institutional changes. All of those explain increases in income. Exploitation does not explain it, to think of how the left thinks about it. Accumulation by itself does not explain it, as the right would argue. What explains it is liberty and diversity. So if we're going to have a modern economy, we need a diverse economy in which people are free to move, to engage in enterprise, small and large. Look, the hair salon down the street, which I need desperately, um, is an entrepreneurial act on a small scale. The owner puts her heart and soul into this enterprise. That's what liberalism permitted. That's what a commitment to a free society delivers. So the foundation of the modern world is not state action, it's not the various kinds of slavery and subordination and the great chain of being. It's not investment, sheer investment. Piling up bricks like that wall in a great pile does you no good at all. There has to be some purpose, some imaginative purpose of making a wall like that. Uh, and the imaginative purpose comes from individual liberated minds. So I raise my glass. Here, this is my glass. And toast diversity and liberty. Thank you very much. If I did yoga, I wouldn't be so stiff. I've got to get back to yoga. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, well, we've, we've time, um, we've put 20 minutes um, for some questions, which I'm sure there are plenty in the audience. Um, so get your thinking caps on. Um, Deidre, thank you very much. That, yes. was, that was really great. Some fabulous ideas coming through there um, in terms of, I think what resonated with me most strongly is at the bottom of all of this is respect yes. owed to the individual. Absolutely. Um, and you talked about the economic benefits and about the, the power of liberalism aligned to us to unleash ideas uh, and that creativity that goes with that, which clearly there's implications of that for you know, the technological implications that That's we're right. seeing today. Are there any downsides to that in terms of Are there any freedom? Where, where does ethics come into all of this? So It's, it's at the foundation. And the, the, the problem that my economist colleagues have, and there are some of them here, and I love you, but the, they think in terms of intermediate causes. As I said, 
Uh, capital accumulation by itself, even educational capital, we're both in, in the business of supplying it, by itself doesn't, isn't progressive necessarily. And after all, the, um, the universities of Europe until 1810 were, were devoted to passing on old knowledge, not creating new. So the great medical schools of, say, Holland were working on Galen's principles in medicine. Mm -hmm. So. But you, you referenced Adam Smith as well, and he was a great advocate of the importance of ethics. In yes, he, he was indeed. The, 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 um, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, which was his 1776 book, is a wonderful book and, and, and amusing, funny, if you like 18th century gentlemanly humor, as I do. But, <laughs> but it's not his most original book. He only wrote two, so he wouldn't be a full professor here at Queens. I mean, just <laughs> two books and no professional articles. Now, come on, Adam. You've got to do better than that. Um, but in, in 1759, he wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is a much more original book. It made his European reputation as a philosopher. And as you're suggesting, it was the basis for ethics. And I think it ought to be read in schools of, of management. Because it, it, it's, it's, it's right to the point. It's, in, in a way, it's a beginning text of social psychology in a way that the wealth of nations is a beginning text of economics. OK. Let's open it up to the floor. Um, questions? Yes, let's start here. Maybe we'll take, are there any other questions at this point? So I'm just struggling to see. Yeah, and then one behind, just with Chris. So we'll take two questions, and then we'll... Well, we'll actually, I would prefer to answer them. One at a time. You're out of I think that's Perfect. more... It's, it's more respectful of the questioner. OK. And since we are... Let's be respectful of the questioner. <laughs> so let's, let's take them, then, one at a time. I'll try to be brief. That's fine. I'll try to be brief as well. I'm not very good at it. Um, thanks, Professor McCluskey. That was a really interesting talk. I was just saying to the lady beside me, it was like intellectual stand-up. Um, you mentioned something that really interested me and something that I've been kind of toying back and forth with in my mind. You mentioned that you are, I think, you said that you're on the advisory board of the new university in Texas, the Kathleen Stock, etc. Yeah. are also working on. Well, for me, I suppose I've always been very left wing, and it, but at the same time, I've always been a big believer in free speech and open debate. Yeah. Um, I think back to just by way of example, when we had the referendum in the Republic of Ireland on the Eighth Amendment abortion in 2018, I've always been very pro choice, yeah. but I would have shuddered at any suggestion. Yes, I am too. I would have shuddered at any suggestion that. Um, that like devout Catholic figures who were vehemently opposed to abortion shouldn't have been heard on TV or whatever. Um, but now, just taking the trans debate, for example, I would consider myself a trans ally. I always have done. I wouldn't agree necessarily agree with anything or much of what the likes of Kathleen Stock, Julie Bindle might say. But I've become very disillusioned with the broad left in Ireland and the UK in that it's now become seemingly, to me, acceptable to banish people who express a view that some people consider abhorrent yeah. Yeah, I from, agree. from decent society. And I don't, th I don't think, I just, I don't think that's, not only is it morally wrong in my view, but it's also intellectually stunting. I, 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 I agree with you yeah. without agreeing with, 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 with Catherine. Um, I, I think she's mistaken on all kinds of grounds. She, she, uh, I, I don't want to parody her uh, worries, but she's worried about men, people with XY genes like I am, um, 
uh, it, she calls them, she, she's more polite than the average turf, but she, she, she doesn't want me in women's restrooms and so on, which I think is just kind of crazy. Uh, how would I work in a male re restroom in this outfit? But, 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 but the, um, her right to speak should not be abridged, and it was at the University of uh, Essex. It's disgraceful. I suppose, can, I, can I just finish that question? Is it okay? I suppose, Ask the question. Like, I read a book recently. Again, I didn't necessarily agree with everything, I, but The Coddling of the American Mind by Greg Lukianoff and yeah. Jonathan Haidt. And they essentially made the argument that by suppressing free speech on university campuses, as you're talking about, in curtailing academic freedom, you're actually doing those young people, those young developing minds coming up in the world a disservice. Would you agree with that yourself? Oh, certainly. And, and uh, it, to protect people from ideas they don't like is a good way of, of, of producing an uncreative person. And that's not good for people's lives. It's not good for their marriages. It's not good for their, for their, uh, for, for their work. No. We, we, we shouldn't be teaching dogma in universities. We should be teaching inquiry, the tools of inquiry. And among them, surely, is free uh, a, a debate. Great. Chris? You know, it, it's, it's odd and interesting that in the United States, the, the right wing of the standard spectrum is the one that uses um, <clears throat> trans issues as a device for causing people to hate each other. In the UK, it's the left that uses this, which, which I think is interesting. In, in either case, it's a hateful exercise, and I'm against hate. Deirdre, my question is about cause and effect. Mm -hmm. I'm an economist, as you know. Uh, we, we, we obsess with causality. Yep. Um, uh, what's causing what here? Is, is it uh, economic prosperity allowing us to afford diversity, or is diversity leading to uh, rich en enrichment? How can we be so sure that the, the cause and effect goes in the diversity leading to well, enrichment direction? Well, it, it certainly goes b both ways. I would accept that. Yet, yet I think the initiation is, is, is from diversity and liberty, combine the two, um, to prosperity. It, it, by which I mean, that the son of a Scottish weaver named Andrew Carnegie could come to the United States and make a fortune by being skilled at the organization of steel mills. Uh, endless numbers of, 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 of scientists have started in, 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 have start, started in the working class in a way that was forbidden in earlier times. It's, it's not that, that, that humans didn't innovate at all. They, they invented things slowly. But with an increasingly diverse society in which you are not held back by your place in the great chain of being, we got inventions, organizational uh, uh, um, in, uh, in changes, and so forth. Now, it's, you're not going to do this econometrically. I have grave doubts about the current practice of econometrics, on which I've written a lot. You're going to have to do it with uh, close micro st uh, 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 um, st uh, 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 
of the sources of good creative uh, people, of, of, how, of how things change when you allow women, for example, to enter law school. Uh, so, you know, it's, you're, it's not going to be by regression analysis with the, with, with the magic fairy dust of instrumental variables that's going to solve this problem. If only it was that easy. What's that? If only it was that easy. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm, for, a, for a person of my PhD generation, I'm well trained in econometrics, but, but I've never used it in my work, essentially. Okay, we have another question just coming here. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> my ears picked up when you uh, had some kind words to say about uh, Milton Friedman. Of who? Was it the, did you mention the Chicago economist? Yes, Milton Friedman, my colleague. Uh, he's, a man, he's a man I would not put on a pedestal. Well, I think I would prefer John Maynard Keynes. But I would ask you, what to consider the impact his theories have had on countries like Chile under Pinochet, in countries like Argentina under the generals, there was not, they might have had come from a liberal perspective, yeah. but the outcome for the people on the ground was hardly a liberal world in which they were yeah, uh, I, I, asking. I, and the other issue about having a small state, as you mentioned, yeah, yeah. you talked about the great inventions. Yeah. It's like a pay on to American capitalism. Yeah. But you have to take into consideration, you mentioned the, the motorways, yeah, yeah. six lane motorways. You have to take into consideration that perhaps many of those motorways were built during the Roosevelt Great Deal period, when the state decided to, it yeah. had to build infrastructure in order yeah. to allow the economy to work efficiently. And I think Roosevelt was probably influenced by John Maynard Keynes, as yeah. were many of the uh, governments look, at look, the time. Look, I, I, and, uh, and <laughs> I understand your, per, I understand your perspective here, but, but I have to say as an economic historian, that, that, that most of your facts are wrong. Um, Milton Friedman didn't advise the government of Chile. But his theories were used. His theories the, were used, by but so were Marxist theories used in Venezuela with, and, and Cuba and the Soviet Union with, with, as I think you'll admit, disastrous effect. No, I mean, uh, we could... We no, could so are we to blame? Uh, no. Karl Marx for the way his theories were used. Right. And indeed, in Chile, if you actually looked into it, and I don't believe you have, you would have learned that Chile went sometime after the coming of Pinochet um, uh, uh, from being one of the poorest countries in Latin America to being one of the most uh, um, uh, prosperous. It's not the case that the um, the divided highway, by the way, had anything to do with FDR as much as I admire FDR in some ways. It was Eisenhower um, who implemented the uh, motorways in the United States, which were invented in Hamburg in the, 19, uh, 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 the, in the 1920s, um, though implemented under, uh, uh, under fascism. So, so, so you have a kind of a anything goes set of facts about the past, but, but I, it, you know, I knew Milton Friedman. He was a man of in integrity and go, goodwill, and his theories have enriched the world gigantically. It's, it's the move in China. In, in this case, directly under the influence of Milton Friedman and his friends, went from $2 a day to $50 a day, the same figure I was talking about before, in, uh, in, 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 in 40 years. But that was the result of free markets. Uh, Hong Kong and, and si Singapore the same way. Um, Hong Kong was a democracy until um, she, Xi Jinping has crushed it, 
Um, Singapore is not a de 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 democracy, but India is imperfect as it is, uh, and tending now in a sadly um, fascist. But, it, but in your direction. liberal in your liberal world view, uh, as I was listening to you, I, I was wondering what opportunity American workers would have to organize trade unions, for example, in, in Amazon, in Walmart, uh, in any of the organizations well, my, that are my, down. My, my, look, I belong to two trade unions in my life. How many of you belong to? I, I'm, I, I, uh, I, I'm the only person in this room who could work as an apprentice electrician in the state of, of, in the state of Michigan. Because my grandfather, my uncle Joe, and my aunt, my uh, 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 cousin Phil, were all members of the electricians' union there, which is a, a closed shop state. So I'm I'm sympathetic with trade unions. I don't think they have an immense effect on the w welfare of workers. But 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 to get back to our theme, trade unions give dignity to workers. They do not, in fact, give them vastly higher income, but they do give them a sense of, uh, of uh, well, th that they're being um, uh, treated well. And I, I must say I'm puzzled why, by, why Walmart, and um, Walmart in particular, has been so fiercely against unionization. I think it's kind of stupid of them. Yes, Bruce. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Um, you've always been provocative, and um, <laughs> really nice to hear you again. Uh, thank you for the quotation from Piers Plowman. Of who? Piers Plowman, the fair oh, yes. for the folk. Now, when I first met you over 40 years ago, you were thinking very hard about risk. I was indeed, still am. So I, yeah, well, I'm glad because I want to ask you about risk. Because, um, and I can't resist asking you this because you're sitting beside a pro vice chancellor in this university. So the question's really for both of you. Um, your vision of a university, of students freely studying what they wish, mm -hmm. being taught by lecturers who are free, freely expressing their ideas and advancing their own research agendas. Mm -hmm. enjoying freedom of speech. That is all about taking risk. Yeah. Okay? Freedom of speech is about taking risk. It is. And in my 40 years of teaching at Queen's, what I found was risk-averse students, yeah. risk-averse students, and a risk-averse university administration. I agree. So how do you reconcile the two? Well, that, that's a deep question. You, you and I have had very much the same experience. Um, I, I, look, I think the source of our enrichment and our enlightenment is ideas. Not, not procedures. And, and so I would urge and administrators to think very hard about the idea of a university, to speak as John Henry Cardinal, Cardinal Newman did, and to ask himself if they're serving by this rule or that rule the idea of a university. I think you and I, dear, have very similar intellectual values. And I, I worry, and I'll, I'll speak to you, you, dear, about having too many priorities in universities. We have to be careful that we don't um, drown the baby in bathwater. Um, that we take, that we, we want to be environmentally sound, and we want to be uh, politically correct, and we want to be this, we want to be that. When our job should be to advance, as you have most spectacularly, historical geography, and I have in a small way economic history, 
So if we, if we do that and then convey that enthusiasm for ideas to our students, I think we create good citizens, environmentally concerned and as to the extent they should be, and so on and so forth, by the way. At least that's the theory of a liberal education. I suppose I'm expected to make a response to this. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I, I fully agree with you. I, I don't have an issue with what you're saying. And I think, actually, students are risk averse, and they're becoming, that's changed over the period. Um, I, I, I was saying to Deidre, when you came in, you actually taught me. Um, as, a, as a student, and things have changed so much in that time, and that's often attributed to the marketization of education. Yeah. You know, students now are paying, it's, our, it's, our it's a product. They're customers. And that's a mistake. They're um, not customers, they're clients. And it's, it's viewed as the economic, what is going to be the economic return to your learning? Yeah. Um, and it doesn't just start in the university, it starts much earlier uh, in the, the primary, the secondary education, in the way that they're being taught. And we see it from our, our funders, our government funders, um, that increasingly it's about the emphasis on STEM subjects with a very nar narrow application within society. But where is the thinking? Where is the, actually the, the development? You might develop your skills, but actually, yeah. to what extent are you developing the human being? So it's, it's about making that wider society also appreciate that there is a value in developing the individual um, and nurturing their critical well, I, thinking. I completely agree with you. In fact, the, the, there's a problem with STEM. Now, I, I, I yield to no one in my enthusiasm for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I think they're all wonderful um, subjects. But it was seriously proposed by the Minister of Education in Japan to eliminate all departments in state universities in Japan. Now, like the United States, Japan has lots of private universities. But in all state universities, he proposed, to el eliminate all subjects except STEM subjects. So the teaching of the history of Japanese poetry would be taken away. The, 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 the teaching of Japanese or world or anything other history would be thrown out the window. You wouldn't uh, have language uh, to study, I guess. You wouldn't, have, um, you wouldn't have economics. I don't see, see the point of economics if it's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the other point is that most science and 99% of mathematics is economically useless and never will be mm -hmm. of any use. So if it's the economy you're trying to improve mm -hmm. with this uh, crazy educational idea, which has become so popular because of the acronym. The acronym is kind of cool and ooh, STEM. Um, it's silly. OK. Um, Sorry to be so violent. But <laughs> I, 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 I think I, we, we do have one, maybe one last question down the back. Hi, Deirdre. I'm Finally, a female voice, thank God. <laughs> Um, I'm interested in your um, perspective on liberalism, which has undoubtedly given us huge increases in income over the period, but there have also been costs associated with that, and one of the biggest sure. costs that we're facing is an externality in the form of climate change. Yeah. So I'm interested in your views on the role that liberalism has to play in potentially solving that problem, or yeah. is it actually contributing to the problem? Well, I, I'm, per, I'm personally very concerned about, uh, about climate change, and something should be done. And what should be done, I think, is rather simple. There should be a carbon tax. It should be high enough to give appropriate in, in incentives in a free society to invent, um, I don't know, me, 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 methods of carbon capture, um, so, 
I, I'm all in, in favor of that. I'm not in favor of detailed intervention. I, we have a, in the United States, we have a big subsidy for wind energy. And that's choosing winners. And the state is notorious for choosing losers. I mean, over and over and over again. So it's probably, it, it's probably good to, in a, in a liberal society, to set high-level incentives for the rule of law and for, uh, um, uh, I don't know, uh, the, mainly the rule of law, and then let people work to this, this carbon tax. Um, there was a hole in the poles of the ozone layer. If the ozone layer goes, we're cooked. We're all going to die of skin cancer. <laughs> and it was getting bigger. And it turned out, as you know, that it was caused by air conditioning fluid and, of all things, hairspray. Margaret Thatcher, who was a big user of hairspray, became alarmed, and she and other leaders for, you know, stopped the use of these uh, fluorocarbons that were causing the problem. And now the ozone hole is getting smaller and smaller. So that kind of sensible environmental regulation, it's not too detailed. It just says, well, no, don't use that stuff at all. Although, you know, the DDT ban much earlier had its problems. But, but let's, let's not get into the details here. The point is, let's not get into the details. Let's let the economy's immense creative powers with sufficient diversity and liberty achieve to go on achieving the astonishing enrichment, not only of one's material life, but one's spiritual life, uh, as it has. Okay, I'm afraid the, the time has, I know there's a few other questions, but hopefully maybe you'll have time to speak um, separately at Certainly. the end. Just conscious of, of some people needing to, to get away. So um, we'd like to draw the, the evening to a close and can I invite our head of school um, to come and, and bring his thanks and close the evening, Ravi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ravi Shankar. On behalf of the management school, I want to thank you, Deirdre, for taking the time to travel here and give the Mary McAleese University lecture in person. Um, in many ways, you are the very embodiment of diversity, given the range of your work in economics, economic history, and statistical methodology, to name but a few of the areas in which you've made important contributions. I think the same applies to your support for, uh, for pluralism in methodology. Uh, and your personal gender journey. At a time when gender-related issues have become matters of public controversy, we particularly appreciate your commitment to academic freedom and, and public debate. These are the foundations of university life, and we must never forget their importance. We were pleased when, earlier this year, you agreed to become an honorary professor in our school. We very much appreciate that during the rest of the week, you will be giving your time and sharing your considerable experience with our staff and our students. We are proud of the fact that we are one of the most diverse schools in the university, both in the demographic sense of the term and the non-demographic sense of the term. 62% of our academic staff, and I should know this, come from outside GB and NI, and 24 different nationalities are represented in our uh, staff staff cohort. Our female representation has been improving and accounts for 38% of academic staff. 
Uh, however, representation of females is lower in economics and finance, and certainly amongst the professoriate. As a management school, we appreciate the importance of making use of all our talents. As academics, we also appreciate that underrepresentation of women has implications for the nature of questions addressed by researchers, the approaches that are valued, and, and the policy advice that is produced. We've set ourselves the goal of increasing the female undergraduate proportion in economics and finance disciplines, and also of increasing the proportion of female staff across the school. As was mentioned earlier, we've made some progress and achieved an Athena Swan Bronze Award. However, much remains to be done. And as the dean and head of school, I'm personally committed to ensuring that all our staff have the opportunity to progress and are provided the support they need to do so. While actions here at Queen's are important, we cannot achieve the required change on our own. We are therefore grateful to those of you in business and in the public and voluntary sectors who've joined us with us, who joined with us in our mission to, to improve opportunities for all of our students, but particularly women. Our work has been greatly enhanced by your provision of scholarships, talks, and placements and employment opportunities. We look forward to continuing this fruitful engagement. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to attend the event. Thanks in particular to Dr. Rene Prendergast, the staff at Riddle Hall, the staff in public engagement, and the Athena Swan Committee for making this possible. For all your hard work, thank you. Finally, thank you again, Deidre. Well, I, I have one concluding remark. You say you're, you have a problem, and we do, in economics of underrepresentation of, uh, of women on the staff. And when that issue comes up, I say, I've done my part. <laughs> <laughs>